Hi everybody, so 3D printing. Well, you can think of it like taking a glue gun, just letting it dribble in a circle, letting it harden. It will, of course, form a cylinder. A lumpy one, for sure, but a cylinder. And that really is what 3D printing is. Of course, it's something we know a lot about now, but early days, it was basically that. The history of 3D printing is surprisingly long, 40 plus years, with the first patent being in 1986 by Chuck Hull for something called Apparatus for the Formation of 3D Objects Through Stereolithography. Stereolithography is where you get a resin and you point a light at it in a certain pattern and that hardens the photosensitive resin and you are effectively taking a picture. But you're doing the same thing. You're doing the same thing as the glue gun. Interestingly enough, Hull's patent wasn't the first patent. He was beaten by a few weeks by a French company uh, and they let their patent lapse because they couldn't find a use for it. And there was a whole group of people in the 80s working on different techniques for the creation of 3D objects. So, for example, um, selective laser sintering, which was Carl Deckard, direct, mes uh, direct metal laser sintering, which was a German company, EOS GmbH. And then, of course, fused deposition model, uh, modeling by S. Scott Crump, with Stratasys as being his company. Of course, Stratasys was uh, formed by Crump and his wife, Lisa, and that still is one of the major companies in FDM, or fused deposition modeling 3D printing. The real problem with early 3D printing was that the devices themselves were just hugely expensive and mostly used for corporations and universities for uh, modelling purposes, really, and prototype development, that kind of thing. And they were too clunky and too expensive for anybody else to be able to afford to do them. And it was really between 2002 and 2014 that all of those early patents began to expire. And of course, what that did was open the market up to um, the creation of other consumer products and other interest groups to start working, particularly with fused deposition modelling or FDM modelling or the filament printers that we all know and love. Now, of course, in the early days, so the 2014 plus, well, 2002 plus, these things were cronky. You had to love them. You would be um, slaving over them, maybe 10 or 12 prints until you got a print. It required finish afterwards. They were always piddling little things like little model robots or praying Buddhas or that kind of thing until you actually got a success with it. So they were fairly clunky in their early days. Prap was one of the early machines, the early low-cost filament printers, and it was made predominantly from plastic parts, and the printer could print its own parts, so it was seen as self-replicating, and because it was open source, anybody could make changes and improvements as long as they shared that imagery or coding or whatever it is that they did. And so it had an element of uh, being able to evolve into something better. So RepRap had... Um, elements of life about it, which makes it really quite interesting. It's still an ongoing open source project, incidentally, if you're interested. But again, you have to be fairly techy to get into it and to really love these machines and want to work on them. Because there are people who love that, me included, incidentally, but there's a whole bigger base of people who basically just want to use the machine to do other stuff with. Of course, this field of 3D printing has grown very rapidly with lots of people entering the market as more and more users have taken it up, begun to share resources and worked out how to um, really cope with some of the earlier bugs. And as people have got into the market, the quality of the product has improved dramatically, allowing people who uh, just want to create models and not want to create machines to enter into it. I mean, perhaps the most popular and well-known of these technologies is FDM, which is uh, Fusion Depth and Position Modeling. It's the filament modeler. And you can find an awful lot of makers. Elegoo, obviously, and we've been working with Elegoo, and we're going to be looking at the Elegoo printers. And then, of course, you've got things like Creality and Ultimaker. So there's an awful lot of FDM printers, and they have a lot to uh, recommend them. But there are competing technologies like SLA, for instance. 
SLA is stereolithography, and again, you'll find uh, Elegoo products on that, things like the, the Mercury and the Saturn being good examples. Of course, they're not the only people involved in that. You, go find, you also find Creality doing one, uh, Form Labs Form 3 is another one, and there's a lot of very good SLA printers that all work on the same principle. They essentially have a light mask and then a photosensitive resin. You expose the mask, it creates a slice that sticks to a bed, the bed is raised, a new mask is exposed, and so on, building the image out of slices. In fact, this is a, a common approach to 3D printing, is to have those slices you build up layer by layer. Now, some of the more esoteric things are probably things like digital light processing. Digital light processing is very, very similar to SLA. Rather than using a light mask, what they use is mirrors. And those mirrors, of course, allow for a bit more of uh, control over where the light goes, and so a finer modeling technique. But, uh, again, going to be quite ex um, expensive because of that. And an example would be something like the Flash Forge Hunter. And the thing that's really um, still in industry is selective laser sintering. Selective laser sintering, for example, something like the Fuse 1, points a laser at a powder and melts the powder and sinters it together. And you're doing things like glass and ceramics and metals with that. But that, again, is a very expensive, but uses the layer-by-layer -layer technique over a bed of powder. So the powdered material, like metal that you want, is layered out, is sintered, new layer sinter, and so on. And another um, derivation of that is selective laser, um, selective laser melting. So instead of sintering it together, when you're really just fusing the edges, you melt the whole material as one layer and build it up that way. Now, um, mm, that's not particularly well known on the consumer market, along with something like electron beam melting, which is very similar to selective laser melting. But perhaps um, the last one that had popularity for a while was uh, layered object manufacturing. Layered object manufacturing is where you get a sheet of material like plastic or paper, cut it out a bit like a laser cutter, then build it up as a layer, gluing those layers together. And there was an Irish company producing a machine, I think it was the Solio. Um, they lasted for a little while, Solio went bankrupt, and I haven't seen anything since. So the two key technologies that are vying in the marketplace at the moment are FDM and SLA. That is in the consumer market, obviously in industry, then things like SLS and SLM play a major, a major role. But in the consumer market is SLA and FDM. And once they worked out the bugs of the actual machine, enough impetus got rolling so there were enough people sharing things. So for example on Thingiverse, where you can find a model for just about anything you're daydreaming about, then it really started to pick up speed and other issues came to the forefront. As opposed to the, the technical aspect of it, it was the ease of use, um, the, the design of the actual machine itself for the consumer in mind. Because the early versions were um, really built by people who were interested in the subject. And of course for your average Joe, that wasn't going to fly. Now we're looking at machines that are designed to do their job. You're looking at those other aspects of it, like ease of use, standalone, cost of the material, um, how well the machine is actually built, and so on and so on and so on. And this is where various machines are beginning to emerge, kind of like leading the pack, where they actually have sorted out the technology to a degree where it has become useful, and are now creating machines that we can just buy and use, as opposed to machines that we have to put together and love and nurse in to do something. Now, I have to admit to being something of a philistine when it comes to these, but I'm an old fart, and you have to remember, I was there at the beginning beginning of 3D printing when it was exactly what I said. I could make anything quicker than a 3D printer uh, and more accurately with hand tools, so why would I bother? And it was such a labour of love and took, took such time to do anything. You spent most of your time nursing the machine and less of your time working on it, so I tried it right then and I was less than impressed, had that impression of it, and then just got on with hand tools and basically ignored them until Alago contacted me. Elegoo sent me this, which is their Neptune Pro 3D printer. I said, yeah, I'll give it a go. And I was absolutely astounded, in fact, because the contact time required is minimal, really. Once you spend the hour or so setting it up, 
you load up your image and set it to print well you walk away and have a cup of tea and do something else instead come back later and it's printed of course that does take faith that machine will actually reach the end of its print and i've been using these things now for what something like three four months printing loads of stuff and that is exactly what i do and i come back and i find that they're printed and of course we printed this thing on it this is a double helix ogrensky style wind turbine printed in five parts and glued together to make that rotor section and it worked beautifully. We've used this with various generators to get some great results. But you can make this by hand, there are handmade versions, but this is a beautiful version that in contact time was probably, I don't know, about 30 minutes or so, in print time well over a week. So I was very impressed by this machine and did some videos on it to basically explain it and show what was being done. And I loved it. And so they sent me this, which is their Neptune um, Plus. And the build volume on that is just incredible, hey? So we printed this. This is an Archimedes screw rotating print, and it's huge. I mean, it's as big as my head. So that will actually take a flow of water and generate, and we were able to print that as one piece from this uh, Neptune 3D Plus. Now, this thing, you can buy the basic version of this for about $120 or about £100. And that's kind of the same price as four bottles of whiskey or like, what is it, seven or eight packs of cigarettes. It, it's phenomenal how inexpensive these things are. This thing's a bit more expensive. It comes in at about $350, about 300 quid or so. And um, still very robust and very usable machine. And I did some videos on this as well, on particularly the large prints. So what Elegoo did was they sent me the Max. And here it is in its box. Now this comes in at about $430. And it's enormous. The build volume is 450 by 450 by 500 millimetres. That's half a metre. So it's almost a, a, a half a metre by half a metre by half a metre. That's just huge. Of course, it's in its box because I've got it. I wanted to take it out straight away. But I feel I ought to make a video of it. So let's get the box open. OK, that's it out of the box. Now, it was well packaged and I don't plan on a step by step. But, um, six screws to put together four parts take about 15 minutes the reason i don't plan on doing it is because this is reflective of the move in the industry the ease of use the ease of setting it up the ease of putting it together is key to people who are doing this now and Ellen are no exception there's um some really good videos showing you how to put it together i've already put two together so it's going to be easy for me i've done videos on putting the other two together so it's going to be four screws up from the bottom bolt on the stairs, plug in your bits. Piece of cake, but there are instruction videos produced by Elegoo showing you exactly how to do it. The thing comes with instructions, including a sheet with big red arrows pointing where you need to bolt these things together. So the ease of doing it is key at the moment to the manufacturers and the sellers of these things. And it's no surprise at all because the industry has come out of its infancy where you have to struggle into creating machines that are usable almost from an hour of opening the box. And I found that to be true. The other two Elegos are expecting exactly the same thing with this. So let's bolt it together. So 15 minutes later, 15 screws, bolts later. There she is, all set up. There's the Max, there's the Plus, and there's the original. Now, the whole point of this is really to talk about that change, how things have changed. In history, when it first started, of course, it was all very techy, all very difficult, all very glitchy. Now, it's a usable product. Now, the things of interest aren't to do with the technology of it, the ins and outs of how it operates. What we're interested in is a machine that can do something. So issues like reliability, ease of use, ease of setting up, those are the kind of things I think we're really concerned about. Other stuff, yeah, it's great to talk about it when you get into it. But remember, I first tried this 10 years ago, hated it. Trying it again now with the new breed of machines, loving it. And I think my experience reflects an awful lot of people's experiences. Because I'm by no means an expert at this. I just picked this up four months ago 
and had, uh, well, huge fun actually, because we've done some great stuff on it already, as you know if you're a follower of the channel. But the history of the development of this has come such a long way. And these Amagu products, um, well, th they are at the forefront of the changes that I'm talking about, because, you know, 15 volts, 15 minutes, and the instructions are like a comic book. There's a help video online. Everything's in little bags with labels on it, and every tool you need to put it together comes in the bag. So essentially, if you can't cope with that, you should not be going into a kitchen where there are sharp things, because there's just nothing to go into on this. That's why I haven't been into it, because there's nothing to talk about. You put those bolts in the little holes with the big red arrow that tells you to put them, you have yourself a machine. Obviously we've used the Elgoo products in the other two, and so we will be using this, and there is a little wrinkle I want to talk about, which is making sure the bed is flat. The setup is Cura, which is, um, it's Elgoo Cura, it's a Cura port. But again, it's super easy to do, it's ridiculously easy to do. And of course we want to print on this. We've already printed on Elgoo machines and found the reliability to be Amazing. I mean, I've had, uh, I think, two failed prints and they were my fault. The other prints we've done, where we've run them for like a week plus, and that's an act of faith, have come off just fine, which is what I believe we want from this kind of machine. A reliable machine you can do something with instead of having to study the technical specs and print something you can use, which has been the whole thing. Elegoo, I think, are... Um, particularly good at that. And the price, I think, is awesome. I mean, this basic setup machine, remember? $120. That's crazy cheap for such a nice machine. And then, of course, we go up to this. This is more expensive. It's about $430. But it's a huge machine, and I am looking forward to playing with it. We will do a couple of other videos on those other aspects of it, for sure. There's the, the bed levelling can be an issue for people. But it is very easy. It's just a slight confusion about it when it comes to it. So I'm going to take the bed apart and show you what they mean when they're actually talking about so it. So I guess we're at the point in history, 3D printers now, where lots of things have been sorted out and it's all about bigger and better, which is where the Max sits. I mean, we can do some awesome stuff on this. And if it starts to get even bigger than this, of course, I guess we could be printing cars, whatever. But that seems to me to be what it's all about. The Max is certainly in that space, and I'm hugely looking forward to playing with it. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching, and please do remember to like and subscribe.